you know, for me, I've, I've had the stomach flu so many times, and uh, perhaps many of you have had the stomach flu uh, many, many times as well. Uh, but if you had the stomach flu before, I think you agree with me that it's just the worst thing ever. If you have the stomach flu, you can't keep any food down. Anything you eat or drink will just come back up, go back out. You can't hold or retain anything. If you've had the stomach flu, perhaps the worst mistake you can make is this. After you've had the stomach flu, after hours and hours of just throwing up and purging everything that you have in your stomach, the worst mistake you can make is after hours of purging, you start feeling a little bit better. After hours of purging, you're empty and you feel hungry and thirsty. Perhaps the worst mistake you can make is to think that you're healed and you're okay when in fact you're not. So what do you do? With an empty stomach, thirsty, you go and you eat and you drink. But we all know if you have the stomach flu and you're not healed, whatever you eat and you drink will come out 10 times faster. Perhaps the worst mistake you can make is if you have not yet been healed but going and trying to consume more because whatever you take in will only continue to make you sick and just spit it back out. For all of us as humans, the sickness that we wrestle with, the sickness that we struggle with, the sickness that we all have is the sickness of sin. So oftentimes, without dealing with the problem of sin, without being healed of the problem of sin through Jesus Christ, maybe we feel good, maybe we think we're okay, Without dealing with the problem of sin, we go through life trying to take on and consume more. Without dealing with the problem of sin, oftentimes we think to ourselves, "May maybe if I serve more, maybe if I do more things, maybe if I go on more missions trips, maybe if I sing more praise songs, maybe if I worship God more, if I try to obey Him more. But if we haven't dealt with the sickness that hinders us first and foremost, the sickness will just continue to persist and everything we try to continue to eat, everything we try to consume, everything we try to do more of will only continue to make a mess out of it. Before we can continue to do more for God, before we can continue to worship God, to obey Him, we must first and foremost deal with the problem of sin, deal with our sickness, otherwise we'll continue to be sick and contaminate those around us. This morning, we're going to look at two whys. Why and why. For us to obey and worship God, why is it important for us to first deal with the problem of sin? Why does sin get in the way of our obedience as witnesses of God? And secondly, why does sin get in the way of our worship to God? To answer these whys, this morning, we're going to finish Psalm 51. So if you would please turn with me your Bible to Psalm chapter 51, and we're going to look at 13 through 19. Psalm 51, 13 through 19. You can find the book of Psalms in your Bibles in the Old Testament. If you open your Bibles about halfway through and then move some to the left, uh, you'll find Psalms, and we'll be in 51, looking at 13 through 19. This is our fourth week in Psalm 51. Uh, we started three weeks ago looking at what David wrote in this psalm. Uh, we see the historical context in 2 Samuel chapters 10 and 11. Uh, David as king, his goal is to obey and to worship God. But as we've seen, there's a huge problem that gets in the way. David cannot obey and worship God because he has not first dealt with his problem of sin. We see the context of the sin that is addressed in chapter 41 in 2 Samuel 10 and 11. In 2 Samuel 10, David commits adultery with Bathsheba, and then he proceeds to commit murder, murdering off Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. David, after committing adultery and murdering, does not repent to God, but instead he continues to try to obey and worship God. 
He continues to try to lead as king. He continues to go to temple worship. And yet, even though he goes through the motions because he has not dealt with his sin, he fails to actually obey and worship God. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, the prophet Nathan, nearly a year after his sin, confronts David. And David finally then repents of his sin. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 13, he finally admits and says, I have indeed sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51 is David's psalm of confession for his sin with Bathsheba and murdering Uriah. In order to obey and worship God, there's a few steps that we first must take to deal with the problem of sin. Uh, Three weeks ago, we saw the first step is that we must confess our sins. In verses 1 through 6, before we can obey God, we must first admit that we're a sinner and confess our sins to God. So we ask the question, how many of us are still going about our day trying to obey and worship God, but we've never and we have not yet repented of our sins? Are we living in unrepented sins even as believers, never giving a thought to continually repent of the sins that God continues to reveal in our lives? After we've confessed of our sins, we are not yet ready to obey and worship God. There's then another step. After we've repented of our sins, then God does his work of regeneration. In verses 7 through 10, it is God who then forgives us of our sins and creates in us a clean heart. We are made a new creation, a new creature in Christ. Our old ways have died, and we are newly born in him. So two weeks ago, looking at Psalm 51, verses 7 through 10, uh, we then asked the question, are you a new creation? Those of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, is there any difference? Is there any change? Has the old self died and now the new is here? Uh, we asked this question. If you were to give a testimony of your life, is there any change? As a new creation, that means you made a complete 180 that you were going and walking in sin, but now you are walking in righteousness and obedience to God. However, sadly for many of us, perhaps our testimony today would be very different. We proclaim to be new creations. However, our testimony is not that we have made a complete 180, but in Christ, somehow we've made a complete 360. We were stuck in sin. We came to Christ. We tried a different way. But all this time later, we just find ourselves back set in our old ways. If this is the case, what are we to do? We saw last week then what we are to do about unrepentant sin, about the habit of going back to sin. We saw in verses 11 through 12, that in order to turn away from continual unrepentant sin, we must commit to continual obedience to God. Our walk with Jesus Christ is not a one-time event, but is a lifelong commitment and progression. For those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, did you surrender a lifelong commitment to Him? Make sure that in your time of despair, as you turn to God, once you feel better, once you have been healed, you don't let go of the things that healed and made you better. Recovered, rehabbed, that dolphin. Hey, I'm good now. I'm going to go jump back in with the sharks. In your time of despair, you turn to community. In your time of despair, you turn to counsel of other believers. In your time of despair, you turn to prayer and Bible study to seek God's will. Then things turn around. In that repentance, you feel rejuvenated. You feel hope. You feel joy and gladness. But stick to it. Keep in community. Keep in Bible study. Keep in prayer. 
and do not neglect those things. Once you have been rehabbed, brought back to life, don't go back to the old ways that were making you sick. Why does it take all these things? In order to obey and worship God, why must we first do verses 1 through 12? Confess, be renewed, and commit to a continual obedience to God. Because if we don't, then we will allow sin to impact our witness and to sin to impact our worship of God. Let's look at verse 13 through 15 to see why sin gets in the way of our obedience as witnesses of God. 13, then, then what? After 1 through 12, after we have confessed, after we have been made new, after we have committed to continual obedience to God, now, then we can obey as witnesses. 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. After we have turned to God and committed our lives to him, made new in him, then we can teach others. Then we can warn and caution others of their sins. Turn back to God and sinners will return to God. 14, deliver me from my blood guiltiness. Again, restore Forgive me, God, O God of my salvation, then what? And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. It is only after we have confessed our sins and only we have been made new, only after we have committed to living a life of righteousness in Christ, then we can be effective witnesses of him. Then we can obey God by telling other peoples to repent. Then we can obey God by being witnesses, by, by worshiping him, by proclaiming his greatness on our lips. To tell transgressors of their sins, to proclaim of God's greatness with our lips. This is a very public profession of our faith and obedience to him. In order for us to bear witness of Jesus Christ, we must first and foremost have been redeemed and commit our lives to following him. Why is it so important? And why does sin get in the way of that? When I was in elementary school, there was a specific time that uh, I got the stomach flu. I was at home. The good thing, I didn't have to go to school. That was great. Uh, but the bad thing was just hours and hours of purging throwing up, puking everything. Eat a little, drink a little. It would not stay in. After a day or two, I was completely empty. I started feeling a little bit better. I told my parents, I've suffered greatly. I need a reward. I've overcome. And so my parents said, great, we've been cooped up in the house because of your sickness. Now that you feel better, let's go to Pizza Hut. Feeling better, we went to Pizza Hut, and we went to Pizza Hut, we went inside, and that was a time when you still get the Pizza Hut buffet. So we went inside, sat down, dined in Pizza Hut buffet. We went through the buffet, I got my pizza, and I started scarfing down my pizza. I thought I was over the stomach flu. I thought I was better. I was sorely mistaken. Soon after consuming the pizza, I started feeling not well again. I let my dad know, hey, dad, it's going to come up. I don't feel good. We already paid the money. Let's finish eating, and then we'll go home. All right. We finish eating. Dad, it's going to come up. So my dad and I, we rush out of Pizza Hut. We try to make it to our car. But before we can get to our car, we rush out of Pizza Hut. I clench my father's hand. My father, feeling me clench his hand, turns and faces me to support me. As he turns and faces me, I proceed to projectile vomit all over his pants. Whatever hits his pants and does not stick to his pants proceeds to splash all on the parking lot floor. Not once. I heave, stick, splash. 
I heave, stick, splash. I heave, stick, splash. This incident scarred both my father and I. Uh, uh, to this day, if I turn to my father and pretend like I'm going to throw up on him, he knows what I'm talking about. As my father and I rush out of Pizza Hut, as I proceed to vomit all over my father and on the parking lot floor, all this while, there's a family who had just parked their car and was making their way into Pizza Hut. As they were making their way to go into Pizza Hut, they saw me rush out of Pizza Hut. As they were making their way into Pizza Hut, they saw me throw up all over my father and all over the parking lot. This family stopped, turned around, got in their car, and left. <laughs> this family did not know exactly what happened in Pizza Hut. But based on what they saw when my father and I came out of Pizza Hut, they knew they wanted no part with Pizza Hut. Why is it so crucial that we have made right with God, that we have renewed a new spirit within us? Why is it so crucial that we are like Christ before we profess and proclaim and tell others who Christ is? If we continue to live in sin, and yet our family members, our co-workers, strangers, people we meet, they don't read the Bible, but, but they know we read the Bible. They don't go to Sunday service, but they know that we come to Sunday service. They don't go to small groups, but they know we go to small groups. They don't pray to our God, but they know we pray to our God. They don't know exactly what goes on in here but as they see us rush out, as they see how we act and behave, they don't know exactly what goes on when we read our Bibles, but based on what they see when we leave, are they going to want any part of that? After we've done our quiet time and yet we leave still sick, vomiting over our friends, hurting our relationships, having a spirit of unforgiveness, People who don't read their Bibles will say, I don't know what he read, but based on what he's doing to other people, I won't get back in my car and leave. I don't need to go into that Pizza Hut. You know, I don't know what my friend does when he goes to PCAC. I don't know what mom and dad do during big church. But after, every time they leave big church, man, will your kids, will the next generation say, man, I don't want to go meet that God in big church because I see what happens to mom and dad every time they leave big church. Hey, come to small group. Come to our community. But every time people see our small group, our community in action in our neighborhoods and outside, are we vomiting over each other, hurting each other with our words and our actions that when other people see it, they're thinking to ourselves, whoa, whoa. I don't want to eat what they're eating. I don't want to have any part in what they're doing. It is so crucial that we do not continue to live in unrepentant sin because then we paint a false picture of who the God we serve is. Instead of encouraging others to repent of their sins and turn to him, we then become ineffective witnesses of Christ. Why does sin get in the way of our witness? Have you repented of your sins? As you tell others of the things that you are doing for God, as you tell others of the ways that you have served Him, as you tell of others of the mission trips you go on, of the Sunday schools you teach, of the prayer time and the quiet time that you have, you know, praise God that you will be able to share that with others. But first and foremost, Make sure that you confess your sins and commit to a lifelong of obeying Him. Secondly, why does sin get in the way of our worship of God? Going on, 
verses 16 through 19. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Verse 16 again. For you will not delight in sacrifice. Why does David say God will not delight in sacrifice? In the Mosaic law that God gave to his people, God is the one who instituted the practice of sacrifice. God is the one who told his people to sacrifice and to give burnt offerings, to sacrifice animals, to sacrifice wheat and grain and fruit, to sacrifice all these things. Is this not what God delights in? Israel was to sacrifice in faith. This was an act of faith and obedience in response to their repentance and forgiveness of sin. First, before sacrificing to God, Israel, God's people, they were to confess their sins and to be forgiven by God and to commit their lives to obey God. As a result of that, they would then make sacrifices that would represent the forgiveness of sins. But what was Israel doing? What was David doing before he confessed to God? They skipped the whole confession part. They skipped the whole repentance part. They skipped the whole committing to obeying God part. And instead, we're just so busy slaughtering animals. The prophet Isaiah says from God, I'm tired of your sacrifice. I'm full. God can't be full. But this is language to describe how much they're sacrificing. How much would you need to kill and sacrifice to make God full? There is no end to Israel's sacrifice of animals. They're slaughtering and bloodletting everywhere, every day. But what's missing? Their broken and contrite heart. A heart of humility, a heart of surrender to God. God does not delight in our sacrifice. For us today, God does not delight in our religious activity, in our religious actions. What does God delight in? God delights when we come before Him in surrender and repentance, and to seek obedience. To reflect this morning, then, is this. Are you obeying and worshiping God? How are you obeying and worshiping God? For myself, maybe for you as well, when I think about this question, My gut instinct, my reaction is then to list all the things that I'm doing for God. Am I obeying and worshiping God? Yeah, I'm singing songs to Him. Yeah, I I do service projects. Yeah, I I help out in certain ministries. Yeah, I I tell people about the good news. Yes, I pray. Yes, I I do my quiet time. Yes, I, I go to small group. Yes, I'm in community. but we must be careful. Are we actually worshiping and obeying God? Are we doing that which God delights in? How do you know whether or not you're worshiping and obeying God? How do you know whether or not you're living a light that God delights in? You will know not based upon how many religious activities you do, but you will know based upon whether or not you come before God with a broken and contrite heart, whether or not you come before God in repentance and commitment to obey Him. As you think about this question, are you obeying and worshiping God? May you not list all the outward actions you are doing. May you not list all the religious activities you are involved in, but may you be able to give a firm answer Yes, not because of all the sacrifice and things you're doing, but because you know very well that you go before God in confession 
and obedience and commitment to Him. As we wind down this year, reflecting on 2018, has this been a year of obedience? Has this been a year of worship for you, for your family? As we look to 2019, will 2019 be a year of obedience and worship to God? As we reflect on 2018, your assessment of whether or not you have worshiped and obeyed God. Don't tabulate how many months or weeks you served at PCAC. Don't tabulate how many weeks you've been to small group. Don't tabulate how many missions trips you've been to. Don't tabulate how much you've given to the offering. Don't tabulate how long you've spent praying. Don't tabulate how long you've spent reading your Bibles. Instead, assess whether or not you have obeyed and worshiped God based on whether or not you've come before God with a contrite and broken heart. Whether or not through spending time in His Word and Scriptures, whether or not through spending time in community with fellow believers, that God has convicted your heart of the sin that you have. Are you worshiping God by confessing your sins and committing your life to obey Him? For 2019, there's going to be a lot of things to plan for. We'll talk about our youth mission trips that are coming up, our adult mission trips that are coming up. We've got men's studies and women's studies lined up. We've got plans to grow and to multiply our small groups. But let's put all that aside. Let's not prioritize any of those things. Instead, may the measure be our confession and commitment to obey Him. Then after that, the rest will be an outflow of that confession and obedience. Let's take a moment as we come to the Lord's table, as we do every first Sunday of the month, to not get lost in the business of all that we're doing. Let us take a moment to confess and to commit our lives to Him. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you will continue to participate in the things that are going on in your PCAC. But I hope that the busyness of our activities would not get in the way of worshiping and obeying God. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict you of sin and righteousness, of your need of a Savior, and that you would repent of your sins and believe that Jesus is who He says He is. This morning, if you do know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, uh, take a moment to reflect. Are you faithfully obeying Him? Is there unrepentant sin in your life that you need to deal with, that you need to give up to God? Take a moment then to confess, to turn away from sin, and commit to obeying Him. For those of you who know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, as you are ready, come forward, take both elements, the bread and the cup, return to your seats, and we'll eat and drink together. Come as you're ready.